Welcome to the Mid-Atlantic Association of Museums virtual program, Redefining Narrative, a series of conversations with scholars and leaders in the cultural sector. I'm Deborah Schwartz. I serve on the Mid-Atlantic Association of Museums Board of Directors, and I am delighted to be your, your host. Redefining Narrative invites viewers to explore new approaches to working within the cultural sector, presenting fresh ideas about the pressing issues of our time, and in many cases, disrupting age old formulas for what we expect to find within the confines of museums. Each episode is approximately 30 to 45 minutes long, and we hope each of our, of our five part series will encourage conversation and debate for people who work in museums, as well as students and the general public who are curious about why and how museums make the choices they do. On behalf of the staff and board of MAM, I want to acknowledge that this program was funded in part by Humanities New York with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. In today's episode of Redefining Narrative, we will speak about the importance of oral history in helping us create a more inclusive history of America and the value of listening in working towards equity, understanding, and empathy throughout our culture. To that end, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Zahir Ali, an educator and oral historian with more than a decade of experience directing nationally recognized public history and cultural heritage initiatives. He is currently the inaugural executive director of the Hutchins Institute for Social Justice at the Lawrenceville School an innovative secondary school initiative supporting social justice teaching through scholarship, programming, and experiential learning. In addition, Zahir is an executive producer of American Muslims, a history re revealed, a film series currently in production. In 2020, he was senior fellow of the Pillars Fund Muslim Narrative Change Cohort and a recipient of the Open Society Foundation's Soros Equality Fellowship. I am proud to say that Zahir and I work together at the Brooklyn Historical Society, now the Center for Brooklyn History, where I was president and Zahir was oral historian. During his tenure there, he directed the Muslims in Brooklyn Initiative, which was recipient to the 2021 Special Jury Social Justice Prize from the Glammy Awards and a Muse Award from the American Alliance of Museums. He is also the co-producer and co-host of a podcast, which was called Flatbush in Maine, which was an award-winning monthly podcast. Formerly, he was the project manager of Columbia University's Malcolm X Project, and it, his oral history interviews informed the late Manning Maribel's Pulitzer Prize winning biography, Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention. His work on Malcolm X has been featured in CNN's Witnessed, The Assassination of Malcolm X, and Netflix. Who Killed Malcolm X, and Blood Brothers, Malcolm X, and Muhammad Ali. There is so much more to say about Zahir, but in the interest of time, please join me in welcoming Zahir Ali. Thank you so much, uh, Deborah, uh, for that wonderful and generous introduction. And thank you to Carolyn Brown and the Mid-Atlantic Association of Museums for this opportunity. I'm going to share my screen. I'm really excited to talk about this uh, topic um, because oral histories have the power to both um, inform and transform the work that museums and public history institutions do. 
Uh, in this brief talk, I hope to highlight some of the key points for us to consider when embarking on oral history projects. The way that we're going to proceed with this is to um, look at this through the lens of a case study uh, to help illustrate these points um, and using the Muslims in Brooklyn initiative that Deborah mentioned that we worked on at Brooklyn Historical Society, which is now the Center for Brooklyn History. Uh, and I'm going to walk you through some of our experiences that really underscored for me the necessity to think about oral history and in particular, the centrality of listening in the story sharing work that we do. Uh, for some background, the Muslims in Brooklyn project is a multi-year public arts and history project that included oral histories, an exhibition, public art campaign, community programming, educational curriculum, and podcast episodes. It, it was truly a mammoth project um, that all started as an oral history project. So we scaled it up with um, capacity and resources. There were three main core messages for this project. One, that Muslims have a diverse, uh, Muslims have a long history uh, in Brooklyn, in New York City, and in the United States. Second, that Muslims are diverse people and cannot be profiled by any one nationality, ethnicity, racial group, language, neighborhood, gender, sexuality, or even sect. And three, that Muslims are Brooklynites and have been integral members of our community shaping the city as much as they have been shaped by it. The project was launched in 2017 at a time that there was an increase in Islamophobia and anti-Muslim bias incidents and attacks, and at a time when some sectors of our own government seemed hostile to or targeted Muslim communities. Um, while we thought our project was necessary to counter that, that alone was not enough to convince people to share their stories with us. So rather than jump into doing oral histories, we probably spent a number of months talking with community members before even thinking of bringing a recorder. We talked with leaders, community members, students, educators, organizers, business owners, artists, laborers, a full range of people. And these conversations helped us understand how the community saw themselves, what kinds of stories they felt were important and help us understand how they saw us as an institution. This in turn helped us to understand narrative practice as more than just storytelling. When most people um, think of oral history, they um, think of the interpretive work. Uh, most museums and public history institutions think of saying, you know, think of doing an oral history project in relationship to an, a research project or an exhibition. Um, that oral history is a methodology for accessing voices and experiences that help speak to the silences in our collections with these interviews. And in fact, the interviewing is often what most people think of and are focused on. Even in project planning, most of the organizing and budgeting is done around interviewing, the research, the personnel, the costs. But this is only part of it. Oral history is an interpretive method, but it is also an archival practice. And so just as important um, as interviewing is the commitment by the institution to archive these interviews. Um, this is something that will require processing, cataloging, preservation, and access over the long term we may embark on an oral history project for a specific exhibition or project, but it is really important for us to understand and keep in mind that those oral histories have the power to speak to many different topics, themes, and histories, and generations of researchers and students. And so in order for us to do justice to the richness of the stories that are shared with us through oral histories, we must ensure that they are accessible beyond any one particular use. And this brings me to the final um, understanding of oral history, and that is oral history as an ethical practice. 
if people often first think of oral history as the method, and then sometimes we'll continue to think about it as the archive of this thing that the method has acquired, many seldom get to this final point, which is that oral history as an ethical practice is a way of engaging and building community. Central to the practice of oral history are the concepts of informed consent and shared authority, that there is transparency in the asking and receiving of a story, and the idea that the story is a co-creation. Our storytellers, our narrators, are our partners. This might be the order in which we think of oral histories, interpretive method, archival object, ethical practice, but I would like for us to reverse this order, that oral history as part of our interpretive method is actually not where we should start. That when we're thinking about the role of oral history, we should start with the ethical practices that oral history enjoins upon us. Because when we think about redefining narrative, it means defining narrative beyond the stories we tell. It means thinking about the stories we listen to, and narrative also refers to the stories our institutions tell about ourselves. This should be a transformative practice of the fu very fundamental ways we operate and central to that ethical practice is listening. This is probably um, one of my favorite quotes of the import on the importance of listening um, from Alessandra Portelli, who is considered one of the foremost practitioners of oral history as a formal um, academic or methodological practice. And that quote is, the essential art of the oral historian is the art of listening. And so as we think about the role of oral history in redefining narrative, I want to focus um, on the art of listening in redefining narrative. So what is listening? Well, listening is, let's start with that ethical practice. Listening is creating and building trust through community engagement. We could identify this parallel to what people call affiliative listening, listening to build relationships, to build connections. And so this means that oral history, before we even start interviewing people, before we even start identifying people to interview, we first must create and build trust with communities. And that's what we did with the Muslims in Brooklyn project. We sponsored community events like this community iftar, which is the fast breaking meal during the month of Ramadan. Um, we talked with people before we even began thinking about interviewing um, because we understood that these communities are you know, we're not entitled to anyone's stories and no one's obligated to tell us their story. So when someone is sharing a story with us as an institution, it is a gift. It is a donation like any other item donated to our collection. And in order to be offered such a gift, we have to build relationships. And so we could consider this kind of listening, this listening to build relationships as the first step in using oral history to redefine narrative. How are we connecting with our communities? How are we creating both physical and metaphorical space wherein they feel welcome and their voices feel welcome um, so that they can share our stories? And how are we demonstrating that we can be entrusted with their lived experience? This practice of community building was really important to the success of the Muslims in Brooklyn project and as I mentioned to you, this project emerged at a time when many Muslim communities felt targeted. And it is during this time when there was the Supreme Court decision in June of 2018 that upheld the Muslim ban. And so we could not, um, as an institution, just kind of carry on with this project without acknowledging this. And I think for me, this was one of the one of my proudest moments working on this project um, because it demonstrated how we as an institution were being transformed by the work that we were doing. And we issued the statement um, supporting and affirming Muslim communities. 
um, that in this statement, which said that we want Brooklyn's Muslim communities in particular to know that their stories, their struggles, and their contributions are embraced and deeply valued by the Brooklyn Historical Society. This demonstrated solidarity, this signal to Muslim communities that we wanted to make our institution a place where they felt at home, a place where they could share and to which they could entrust their stories. It also demonstrated that we were listening, the kind of listening that is engagement, the kind of listening that changes the institution itself. So with this trust, is the next step of listening, which is the gathering and collecting of stories. And this process is the archival practice. As an archival practice, it means that we take the same care with their stories that we would take with a precious piece of art or material object. It means that these stories are attended to, that they are not put away in a box after they have been used for an exhibit, that they are cataloged with a finding aid and that they are made accessible according to a narrator agreement and that they are preserved. Our extensive community engagement and trust building paid off in the form of 55 oral histories for this particular collection, totaling over 100 hours of audio. And we, we archive these stories along with our other oral histories. So this is really important. So we didn't have like a place you could go just listen to Muslims in Brooklyn, but you could listen to Muslims in Brooklyn in the context of other experiences in Brooklyn. And so these oral histories are featured on our portal, um, which you can find here at oralhistory.brooklynhistory.org. The entire portal is searchable. So if you can enter a keyword like, uh, I guess like Bedford Stuyvesant, you would get Bedford Stuyvesant stories from Muslims. You would get Bedford Stuyvesant stories from people from the Caribbean. You would get Bedford Stuyvesant stories from um, Jewish uh, uh, residents. You would get Bedford Stuyvesant stories from artists, Bedford Stor Stuyvesant stories from Latinx. And that's the point of this project is to situate these community stories in the broader narrative. And that's what archiving and collecting these stories does. Finally, is the role of the institution as a listening institution to activate these stories and be activated by these stories through interpretive exhibitions and programs. This is the, what we would call reflective listening, where you reflect the impact that the story has had on you as a person, or in this case, as an institution. Um, because most of our oral histories are an hour or 90 minutes or sometimes longer, um, we've had obviously to use um, excerpts. And so it's important when we use excerpts that we keep in mind the narrator's intent, the context, and we allow the excerpt to tell the narrator's story as much as we wanted to tell the story of our exhibition or of our program. And, and if done right, this can both honor the integrity of the stories that have been shared with us and inform the narrative of our exhibitions and programs. So what kind of programs did we have? We had listening parties and these listening parties were gatherings where we invited members of the community um, to listen to curated excerpts and then use those curated excerpts to spark conversation. Not only did we gather people at the institution's location at Brooklyn Historical Society, but if, if we were serious about this project being a project of Muslims in Brooklyn, then we had to be in Brooklyn, all of it. So we gathered in an art gallery in Bedford Stuyvesant. We, we gathered in one of the oldest mosques in the country. We gathered at a learning center. We gathered at libraries and our presence in throughout the communities in Brooklyn affirmed for many community members our commitment to understanding their space and sharing space with them that was a crucial um, element of their storytelling and trust building. These community engagements helped us understand important dynamics around race, gender, ethnicity, faith practice, and other factors that shaped communities in ways that might inform our approach in the ways that we deploy these stories. So again, being not just activating these stories for our purposes, but being activated by these stories to be transformed. 
Here is uh, another um, slide showing some of the images from our um, listening party. And these listening parties were really bridge building and bridge crossing programs that allowed people to share their stories across generation, culture, race, ethnicity, gender, religion, um, by using the stories that were told to us as activators for conversation and listening. Another important element of this, of course, was in our exhibitions. And we had both a physical installation, a sound installation that paired excerpts with the work of a visual artist, Camila Janan Rashid. Um, in this exhibition, visitors walked into a room and depending on where they stood spatially or what wall they were facing or what piece of art they were facing, they were hear different stories from different narrators. It was like entering a room full of narratives, full of stories overflowing into one into the other, highlighting the fluidity of our stories and, the exper and experiences and the power of listeners in shaping the flow of those narratives. In addition to the exhibition, we also created a web-based curriculum that used the oral histories to teach important lessons about listening as a creative act, storytelling and placemaking and identity formation. The success of our project was affirmed by um, several awards, some of which, um, which Deborah mentioned from the Glammy and from the American Alliance of Museums. And the impact of our project was also felt in media. We had um, a viral video that um, was produced by Slate.com, which looked at um, the Muslim bean pie, which was featured in several of our oral histories that were part of this project. So I'm just going to play a short clip so you can get a sense of that video. I heard you never tasted the bean pie. I'm a Muslim American. I'm ready to have some real Muslim American food. Okay. Let's try it out. This is exciting. So this a video within four months of it being posted racked up 4.3 million views. Um, and that gives you a sense of the reach of, of this project. I think one of the greatest demonstrations of the transformative power of oral histories is how they help us not give voice to people. And a lot of people say that. They say, we're doing, we're giving voice to people. We're not giving voice to people, but we are recognizing the voices that already exist among those we have not heard before and that we probably have not been listening to. All of our narrators have so much to tell us, to share with us and teach us. And this um, was exemplified in one of our narrators, Shahana Hanif, who on the night of our launch party in 2018, talked about her experience of being interviewed for the project. And so I'm going to play a short clip of that video. The stories, and, and I really appreciated listening to the textures and the voices, to the speed and the tones. Like I loved all of that. And for me, that it's just, it's just been magical and I can't wait for the next part of this. Um, these stories are uncut, so there was no script presented to us. There wasn't something that like, oh no, I didn't want to say that, wait, let me do that again. There was none of that. It was just a spillage. It was like a confessional and like, I appreciate that process so much. And I feel like this process actually helped me be a better listener and also ask questions with depth to just want to know people as a whole, inside, outside, everything. So the reason why I highlight this is because um, that was in 2018 and just almost three years later, Shahana Hanif became the first um, Muslim woman to be elected to the New York City Council. Now we certainly cannot take credit for her talent. She's a very talented organizer and community leader. But we can take credit that through our institution's practice of the art of listening, that we recognized that people like Shahana had made history long before the New York Times' uh, headline, that everyone makes history. And if more of us listen, 
more of that history will be acknowledged. So in closing, I wanna recap these three points. If your institution is interested in doing oral history, I recommend that you think of oral history in these three ways. First, as an ethical practice that builds community partnerships and collaborations. Second, as an archival object that you are committed to be caretakers of for the long term. And third, as an interpretive method that allows the stories to shape your exhibitions and programs, as well as your community outreach and media promotions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Zahir. That was amazing. Uh, it is just spectacular to listen to you um, sort of build uh, the case for the importance of this work um, and demonstrate it in such an incredibly vibrant way. So I can't thank you enough. Um, I also want to just pause and thank our ASL interpreters, Kaylee and Lucy. Thank you for uh, your wonderful work. It's a really important component of the series. So much appreciated. Um, Zahir, I'm going to start by just commenting on um, how beautifully you describe the building of trust with a community. And part of the reason I want to start there is because I'm, I'm really struck by another um, portion of this series that we created um, with a scholar by the name of Kevin White, um, who's an indigenous scholar um, and who talked at great length about his research into indigenous cultures, um, the ways he has and hasn't had access to that information and that you know over decades that information has been hidden from people uh, and the lack of trust that he experiences even though he himself is an indigenous scholar um, and and so I see some of the things that you're talking about the importance of building trust in community uh, with some of the things he was talking about. And I, I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about, uh, you know, how you think of that process of building trust. Yeah, it's, it's so funny, um, as I heard you describe his, the, I guess, his journey or challenges, because, you know, I, I lived in Brooklyn. I was, I'm Muslim. I was like a Muslim in Brooklyn. <laughs> and I made a lot of assumptions when we were doing this project that it would be like quick and easy. And um, what I didn't factor in was um, when people encountered me, they were also encountering an institution, an institution that they were not familiar with. Um, you know, many of these communities have not had the best experiences with institutions. And so um, I had to. You know, and this is something we do with oral history. Oral history really, before you start listening to the other person, you're listening to yourself. And what I mean by that is you're listening to how you are communicating. You're listening to what kind of messages you're sending, both verbally and non-verbally. What are the ways that you bring with you authority, hierarchy, um, you know, institutional representation and so when early on in this project, um, when I, I, I realized that I, there was like this disconnect that I hadn't factored into, I, I realized that I had to first listen to all of the ways that I was presenting, right? Um, and so I think that that, I always kind of come back to listening. I think we think of listening as something you do of other people. And I think first is listening is a kind of self-inventory, right? Like how, well, how are you showing up? How has your institution showed up, right? And um, I think to the credit of an institution like Brooklyn Historical Society, the both the oral history program, which was a, a rich and deep um, and, and many decades long oral history program, uh, had cultivated a reputation uh, of trust, but also the programming that um, Brooklyn Historical Society had been doing um, you know, a whole series before we even started talking about the Muslims in Brooklyn project. Um, I know before I even started working there, there were always these programs on um, on difference and ethnicity and 
understanding. And so I think it's really important for, I guess the short answer is for institutions to, to do that self-listening, to do that self-inventory and think about how you were showing up. Um, and then being really transparent about that when you are in, encountering or talking with people. Um, you know, I talked about Shahana Hanif and we, um, we, we met her, uh, Liz Strong, who's the project coordinator, and I like went out to dinner with her and she walked us around the community and, and, and we just, we didn't even talk about the project. We, we wanted to learn about the community. So I think you have to invest in that kind of, of practice. Uh, I, as you're describing that, I, I actually remember the moment when somebody said to me, uh, that if I were to commit to this kind of level of community engagement, um, that I had to learn about the importance of breaking bread with people. Yes. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a nice Jewish girl, you know, eating is a, like a really important part of our culture, but I, I had never had anybody explain to me something so fundamental, you know, to, to kind of human yeah. dynamics, human Food relations. Is the language. Food yeah. is the language. It's a universal language. We all got to eat. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it, you know, it's, it's so, it's, in, it's an incredible thing to, to commit um, to this. And as you said as in your talk, you know, the, the reality is these things are not then owned by the institution. They are still the stories of the people who you've gathered them from. And that too is something, you know, museums have this sort of thing about owning objects, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, when, I think that was the key thing. Like when we explain to people the the process of the, the our practice of oral history and how um, they would retain copyright of their stories and they were just giving us permission to be custodians that really does open up a whole gateway of trust like where people are just like okay like i don't feel like i'm being exploited i don't feel like this is an extractive process um you you are actually helping me tell my story and all I have to do in return is share it with you. And that, that's, a, that's a wonderful exchange. That's great. Um, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit um, for just a few more minutes of, of this conversation, uh, which I relish. Uh, I wonder if you wouldn't mind uh, giving us a sense of what it means when people talk about your being a public historian. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that we have realized is that museums, you know, function as public institutions, exhibitions, programs, and then they have these research arms to them, which are often connected to our archives and our libraries. Um, it has always struck me, though, that the scholars who come into our museums, particularly as historians, um, function differently than people who are just purely operating in an academic setting. And I'd love to hear your, just a, a little bit of your thinking about sure. that. Sure, and I don't have, I'm sure there's a formal definition of public history and public historian. And for me, it's work that is um, publicly engaged and publicly accessible. Um, and so um, what's really important is the, the communication that happens around the scholarship. Um, I think that, and I come from an, you know, academic trained, you know, like as training to be an academic historian. And um, I think a lot of that training conveys the, I will say, misconception that the idea is enough, um, that the pursuit of the ideas is, and it's a noble thing. It absolutely is a noble thing. 
And then once you've like gotten this idea or formulated this argument and gathered the research, it's like, oh, that's it. I have done it. And, and for some people that is like, that's their jam. Like that is what they do. Um, but the, there is, there is a, um, almost like a midwifery process of like, how do you bring those ideas to a broader public? And how do you engage a broader public around these really important ideas? And I think public historians and people who do public history work are really thinking about bridging a gap that exists between, um, um, you know, a kind of intellectual, um, estrangement from the populace and a popular estrangement from intellectuals, <laughs> right? That these two groups need each other. Um, that people who are doing this, this research, they need to be able to connect with a broader public. And our broader public needs to have access and be informed by these ideas. Um, I remember um, we were working together and I we were, I think you were with me, we we're talking to a funder about uh, another oral history project we're doing. We do a lot of place-based work. And I, <laughs> I said to the funder, I was like, yeah, this is, um, you know, th this, the, the oral histories are, they constitute like, when you listen to them, they constitute their own map, right? And I said, this is counter-hegemonic geography. And she was like, what? <laughs> and I, I said, you know, it's like map making from the bottom up. She was like, say it that way. <laughs> and I think, you know, like that's what that's what I mean. Like we th there is there is a precision in some of the language that comes out of the specialized research. But, um, you know, it's like Erica Badu saying, what good wor what good do your words do if they can't understand you, right? So like that, I think, is, is the fundamental work of public history is to bring these really important ideas, really important historical um, framings to people so that they can understand it, engage it, and, and see history as something, like I said, that we all make, right? Like we are constantly, we are like living history. And so um, I think public history work does that. It helps people, hopefully people walk out of a public history program or an exhibition, um, understanding that they are part of something that is bigger than themselves, that's bigger than all of us. And that's the civic function of the work of public history. That's great, thank you. Uh, and I guess with that, it leads me then to, uh, wonder whether you have found in your time doing this work um, some particularly wonderful examples of uh, either exhibitions or other kinds of uh, uh, work in museums that and libraries that you know you think are particularly powerful, particularly ones that use oral history. Sure. Um, and I, I think maybe we can put the links in after because I don't have the links ready, but um, so I think one is the, there's a lot of gatekeeping I'll say around like oral history and I've been a participant in that gatekeeper largely, <laughs> largely because of the wanting to make sure the ethical, you know, the ethical element is there because a lot of people will say they're doing oral histories and maybe not have given thought about those things. Um, that said, there are a lot of different ways to do oral histories, and I have um, really been thoughtfully provoked by the work of like the New York Public Library and the Brooklyn Public Library with a neighborhood stories project, because that, and I think Queens has like the Queens Memory Project, like so they're, they're the libraries, libraries are doing this sort of crowdsourcing gathering of stories and you know, as as like, I guess a purist oral historian, I might listen to some of these and say like, oh, but like my, like my first oral histories were not perfect. So oral history is an iterative practice where you get better the more you do it. Um, but what's really important with these neighborhood stories projects that are at many of these libraries, it's just gathering stories of everyday people. Um, you know, this will be the, 
sort of multimedia version of the census records, um, generations down the line when someone's like, I trying to do like their family research or, you know, find that person on the neighborhood or learn about this store, this building. Um, you know, we, we normally like go to newspapers, we go to the census records and insurance records, maps, and you, these oral histories are, are providing rich archival material, the, the benefit of which we have yet to really um, reap, and it'll be generations from now. So like, I really like this sort of wide net casting of gathering as many stories as possible that the libraries are doing. Um, I'm also inspired by um, the work that's happening with the digital humanities. Um, and I, you know, not to toot our own horn, but, you know, Brooklyn Historical Society had several important digital projects that were based around oral histories, the crossing borders, bridging generations. Um, is it crossing boundaries, bridging gender? I always got that confused. Crossing borders. Crossing borders, crossing borders bridging generations. Yeah. Yes, CBBG. <laughs> Um, that, the Muslims in Brooklyn website, um, there's another um, that was done out of Philadelphia called Going North, which looked at organizing the um, oral histories around the Great Migration, and it tied it to specific sites in Philadelphia, so it combined mapping and oral history, and that was like a digital humanities project, so I think that, you know, this helps uh, and oral histories are sort of suited for this multimedia thing. And then the final one was an exhibition that I think was in 2018 at, um, I, I don't know the exact location. Again, it was like the like a food exhibition in Williamsburg. It was called Knights of the Raj. And it told the stories of early um, Bangladeshi migrants to New York through um, a, a restaurant. Right. So there was like food that was served. And then there was like a projection with oral histories. It was really immersive and experiential. And so I I've been inspired by the wide casting net of libraries, inspired by the digital humanities projects that really allow this work to come into the classrooms and also the kinds of exhibitions that immerse people in an experience, um, you know, and the sort of surrounding them with sensory um, inputs, whether it's visuals, audio, video, food, you know, that kind of thing. Great. Thank you. We will uh, we'll include the links so yeah. that people can find and explore more on their own. So as I hear, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to do this. It was really just a joy to listen to you describe your process and the importance of this work uh, in, in the field of museums. And uh, I, I'm so grateful to you for, for everything that you're, you continue to do in the field. And I, I can't wait to see what happens next. So well, thank, thank you so much. And thank you for giving me again, this opportunity to, um, to think more in a codifying way of, of some of the things that sort of organically came up and in, in, um, in the work that we were fortunate to do together at Brooklyn Historical Society. Thanks.